Howdy, folks. How's everybody today? Let's get started here. There we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about progression, but I'm going to talk about it from a big picture perspective, how societies and large-scale systems evolve. Uh, and one of my themes is going to be progression doesn't necessarily mean progress. It basically just means one thing after another. I forget who it was who said, history is just one damn thing after another. And I'd say uh, progression is the same thing. Uh, not necessarily in a straight line, sometimes it's kind of surprising. For instance, here's a star that's been doing its thing quietly for a couple of billion years. Cue the video. Yo, yo, video. Okay, after a couple of billion years of being a bright and shiny star, now it's been blown up because it's reached the transition point. In a very short period of time, it transitioned from one state to another, and it's now a big ball of dust and gas. But that's not necessarily the end. Hundreds of millions of years later, it starts to coalesce into a new sun, a new solar system. And eventually, it could become our sun and then our Earth. In fact, it's thought by astronomers that our sun is in the third generation of the life and deaths of stars. So uh, progression isn't always positive, but it co goes down and often comes back up. Another example, and this comes closer to my theme of uh, social system progression, is Rome. Uh, once the uh, mistress of the Mediterranean, you know, the most ferocious army assembled in the ancient world, controlled most of the territory around the Mediterranean and a long way inland. But then, oops, around uh, 470 AD, down it went. And amazingly, uh, the city that had had a population of almost 2 million by 1100 had a population of 15,000. Imagine your favorite post-apocalyptic movie and uh, you can imagine 15,000 people in the ruins of Rome. That's what it looked like uh, after the fall. So discontinuous events happen, and I call them, and in complexity science we call them, movements between basins of attraction. A basin of attraction, think of like a rubber sheet with a couple of weights in it. Uh, systems are stable in the basins, and they're unstable between the basins, and typically complex systems move between the basins. Another quick example is a two-dimensional cut. If something's in a little cup, something perturbs it, and it moves over to the next basin. Another name for basins, which I'm going to use for the rest of my talk, is network attractors. Because one can think of any one basin having other attractors nearby, uh, like this, uh, that the system can go in. And we can think about our own current status quo, which I like to call game A, as being this uh, little bin in the middle. And the other ones are the network attractors nearby. Now, our game A is showing serious signs of instability. Uh, you know, the, the prime value these days seems to be to maximize short-term money-on-money return. Uh, you know, ex the exemplar is money in politics, which has essentially allowed big money to hack the political system. And the control mechanism, which used to be the will of the people, is expressed through political institutions. The system now has no self-restraint. It's only optimizing on short-term money and money return. And so what does that result then? Systemic fragility. No one wants to pay for social goods like robustness and resilience. Our financial system is famously unstable, and I expect to see some great instability by 2016 and maybe earlier than that. Uh, our infrastructure is very vulnerable. No one's willing to pay to make it uh, robust with respect to EMP or solar flares, etc. cetera, uh, environmental collapse, races to the bottom everywhere, uh, and indeed, uh, the game has got, become such a sucker bet for so many people, particularly in the United States and in the advanced West, that one could expect a revolution at some point uh, that uh, threatens the support of the people for the status quo. And uh, if you look at history, most likely those revolutions will be actually exploited by unscrupulous adventurers of Napoleon, Hitler, that sort, and most revolutions end badly. So what can we do to avoid that? Uh, you know, here we are. We're moving towards uh, that unstable area between uh, tractors. And so let's think about some, what some of the transitions might be and what we might be able to do about it. So again, uh, the idea is that we, a society is in a basin of attraction. It lasts for, in our case, maybe 300 years. And at some point, it moves to another attractor. What might be some of the neighboring attractors to the current system? Some of the ones that come to my mind 
or neo-feudalism, if the Koch brothers had their way, right? Uh, government goes away and money controls everything in a very raw sense. Neo-fascism in the Chinese model, uh, kind of a runaway capitalism plus authoritarian government plus militarism plus nationalism. Neo-dark ages, uh, they're probably a little bit of a dark horse at the moment, but neo, uh, but religious fundamentalists of all sorts around the world, if they had their way, we'd have something that looked like uh, Europe in 900 AD, where religion was everything. Collapse of the environmental sort, endogenous collapse, like financial systems or revolution. Not pretty, but of course those aren't the only attractors that are possible. And so, what I've been working on with some other people we call Game B, a good attractor. Imagine our society transitioning from its current state to a better state, not, not to one of those other worst states. In fact, I would argue that number one priority for people today should be creating a winning good attractor for our civilization. You know, the first couple of things that need to be done are break the power of money in politics. That's job one. Without that, the rest of it's impossible and then build restraints back into the economic system. You know, I'm not a person who speaks against the market. The market is actually a brilliant invention that has all kinds of attributes for equilibrium and information sharing and, and such that so far has been unequal, I'm not sure it will be, and run correctly, it's like a furnace that can heat our house. But the way we're currently uh, operating our economic system, uh, we've let the fire out of the furnace and it's burning the house down, it'll probably burn the whole neighborhood down if we don't do something about it build new values. Maybe, this is just a proposal, self-actualization becomes our number one value, not he who dies with the most toys wins. Something like that. Wouldn't that be great? Optimize society for real sustainability and quality of life, not money on money return. Imagine a financial, economic, and monetary system that works for the people rather than vice versa. So what can you do? What can I do? What can we all do? First priority, and this is job one, until this is done, the other stuff's impossible, join the fight against money in politics. It's a little moderate for my, my taste, but none, nonetheless, the person doing the, the best work today is uh, Lawrence Lessig and his pack at Mayday.us. Uh, what they're doing is actually using the uh, rope of the status quo against them, which is setting up a pack to back politicians or uh, new entrants into political life who actually want uh, to get money out of politics. Uh, next, experiment with new monetary and financial approaches. Uh, Bitcoin isn't it, but it's worth playing with. And uh, we, we need to think of a way for finance to be a tool uh, for useful work, not an end in itself. That's, again, the, uh, the big error of our current system. Supporters start new political parties. I'm done with the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, Walt, Ralph Nader said, the Democrats are the pro-abortion Wall Street Party and the Republicans are the anti-abortion Wall Street Party. And I think he's got it right. It's time for a new political party. Someone should go start one. Somebody out here should go do it, right? Uh, and folk, at least some of our efforts on deep institutional change, not just surface issues. In fact, it's part of the sucker game of the status quo uh, to keep people's uh, political energy used up in uh, surface fights about abortion or gay marriage, etc. cetera, uh, legaliz legalization of marijuana. I believe all those are good things, but they're not fundamental. They don't get to the institutional structure of how our society works. So, you know, again, the deep ones, money in politics, a people's monetary system where instead of banks creating money for their own profit, suppose all the new money entered the system as a grant to each citizen per capita. Wouldn't that be interesting, right? Uh, useful and transparent finance, uh, serious carbon tax, uh, and a citizenship wage where each citizen got, say, $10,000 a year just for showing up. Uh, these, these are ways to substantially redress uh, the balance between the people and the money. And it's within the power of the people to do this. The Constitution allows all these things. But people sitting on their ass have not allowed it to happen. They've let the, the money guys control things. And here's some traps to avoid. I've been working on ideas like this for uh, about two and a half years now. And uh, here's some of the attract, bad attractors I've seen at the smaller level uh, in the alternative space. Uh, some people say a oh, personal change is enough. You know, I will uh, buy a Prius and I've done my thing. It helps, but not nearly enough. We need to create collective action on a mass scale to build new institutions. Some other people say, well, you know, I can't deal with the problems of the world, the problems of my country. I'll just deal with my neighborhood. I'll put in a community garden. And again, it's good. It's a little step. 
but our real problems and challenges are systemic and global, and engaged citizens must think both locally and systematically. Don't be afraid to take on the big questions. And here's one, probably a little controversial, but I've seen it once in my own efforts, and I've seen it uh, twice in other people's efforts. When the going gets tough and you're feeling you know, just worn out and you know, you're not making any progress, resist the temptation to retreat into religion or spirituality. Uh, you know, in fact, I'm going to you know, rephrase Marx. Uh, I'm going to describe spirituality, whatever the hell that is exactly, uh, is the opiate of the alternative world. Uh, when people are feeling bad about themselves, they retreat to spirituality. Uh, I could go on for two hours on that topic alone, but it's a bankrupt approach. And people at first say, what a bleak world, a world without meaning. Uh, meaning. I say, that isn't actually, that's great. It should be empowering. We now have both the freedom and the responsibility to design our own future. For the first time in the history of humanity, you know, various superstitions don't have to control uh, what we do as a people. And good intentions aren't enough, uh, Occupy being the classic example. You must execute well while building a new society. Above all else, courage and per perseverance. Uh, this journey to building a new world is not going to be easy, uh, but it's absolutely critical. If, we, if it doesn't happen, when the change comes, it's going to be to one of those bad attractors I talked about before, and I don't think any of us want that. At the end of the day, though, there's hope. Uh, working together and working collectively and on the big, deep institutional problems, there's a possibility of creating a, a new attractor so as our current status quo continues to uh, stumble, we can have a new and better world. Thank you very much.